sermon passage this morning is in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 3, and we're only going to read the first 10 verses, but I plan on going much further than that, and it is a narrative, so um, you know, don't expect to be here past lunchtime. We'll, we're going to roll through, but we're going to actually end on chapter 4, verse 5, so I hope that doesn't scare you too much, but, um, but initially we're just going to read the first 10 verses here. Acts 3, verses 1 through 10. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was carried to the temple gate, called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg for those, beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Word of the Lord. <clears throat> so what began as uh, perhaps just another day, uh, especially for this man, it uh, turned out to be anything but that. And um, how often do we live as if it's just going to be another day, uh, perhaps like this man did when he woke up that morning? There's a song called Another Day in Paradise by Phil Collins that some of you might remember. Uh, I was looking at it this morning. It's from 1989, back in uh, December of 1989. And uh, I don't know why, but this saying, uh, this phrase, just another day, kept popping in my head as I was thinking about this message. You know? <laughs> Man, it might kick me out of here for that. I might try. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get one of the lyrics here soon, so I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you then. <laughs> Brace yourselves. <laughs> um, so another day in paradise. Phil Collins has a lot of hits. I know it's probably hard to remember them all, but, you know, this is, this is one of them. So in the music video uh, for the song, it, it features a, a real somber-looking Phil Collins, and he's singing this song with, a, with its sarcastic name or title, Another Day in Paradise. And uh, during the video, there's images of uh, homeless people suffering from all around the world, and throughout the video, there's also, he flashes some statistics on the screen. Uh, but Phil is clearly in this song and in this video trying to get a message across, or kind of a cry out for help based on his lyrics. And he cannot seem to get past his own cynicism when he says, oh, <laughs> oh no, here we go, oh, think twice, because it's another day for you and me in paradise. Does that ring a bell? <laughs> A <laughs> little pitchy, a little pitchy, I'm sure. Another day for you, uh, oh, think twice, another day for you and me. Do you remember it, now that I did all that? Yeah, you're, are you kidding? When I play guitar, Chrissy says all my uh, songs sound the same, so maybe my <laughs> singing does too, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Um, so uh, the song, uh, in the lyric, he says, think twice, it's another day, because it's another day for you and me in paradise, and... Um, he says this as if to say, don't expect any uh, hope or change or mercy or charity in this cruel world that we live in. That's basically what he's trying to say. And before the third verse, he even cries out to the Lord asking, uh, oh Lord, is there nothing anybody can do? There must be something you can say. And he's pleading out to God at this point. And of course, I wonder if Phil himself has tried to intervene and maybe done something in the, in the name of God himself. But that's another conversation for another day. Perhaps today, uh, you can relate to how Phil was feeling, maybe, maybe a little bit. Losing hope in humanity, crying out to God for help. Perhaps some of those things have also affected how you feel personally about yourself, physically or spiritually, uh, with hope and faith kind of dwindling. Maybe for some of us, we're just hoping today will be less hard, confusing and troublesome than yesterday was, without much faith or hope or joy uh, in sight in our future. <clears throat> Maybe sometimes the most we can conjure up 
um, on any given day is just a little bit of faith, or at best, mediocre or average faith with tempered expectations, just hoping to get by or hoping to survive the day, not expecting much of anything from the Lord. When I was younger and a non-believer, I would often groan and complain about getting up for work or taking care of the responsibilities that I didn't really feel like dealing with on any given day. Pretty much if anything inconvenienced me or set me off the course from doing the things that I really desired to do uh, within the time frame that I wanted to do them, like traffic or unexpected you know, bills or costs or change of, changes of plans, someone trying to get me to commit to something I didn't really want to do, etc., I would, um, I would get frustrated, I would get kind of bitter, I would get down in the dumps. But looking back, I know that was because all of my hope and peace and joy and love would live and die with my own emotions. It's, it started and ended with me. And that's because I was number one in my own life. And I was the center of my own world. It was all about me. <clears throat> As a believer uh, today, I, of course, like everyone, still have uh, good days and bad days, but I'm grateful that I found this daily hope and love and joy and peace that I found in Christ and that I can always look to him when I find myself approaching that old cynical territory that I used to live in every day. In fact, we all can. <clears throat> but there's still some constant reminders of this grim, cynical territory all around me, uh, even in my life today. <laughs> when I go to work, I try to greet everyone on the way to my desk and, and, and tell everyone I see you good morning and ask how they're doing and maybe make a little small talk if the opportunity presents itself. And I usually get the typical good morning and response from everyone. Uh, but some people, it almost, without fail, there's always going to be someone that says, how you doing today? Oh, I'm living the dream. You know, you ever heard that before? Living the dream, another day in paradise, just like the Phil Collins song. Just another day in paradise. And though I, and I'm sure you, also um, have had some of those days ourselves, and we understand what they're saying, we kind of understand the sentiment, I also have to chuckle a little bit because um, in the grand scheme of life, you know, we, especially the people in my office, as an example, and so many others physically have it pretty good in, in life. Uh, and I imagine most of the world would probably be pretty, good, uh, pretty disgusted to hear some of the complaints if they saw how we lived each day and, and how well we do have it. And I don't say any of that to minimize anyone's daily struggles. I know we all face struggles, and you know, wherever they fall on the spectrum, they are struggles nonetheless. But just to maybe try to put them into a little more perspective or, or shine a different light on them. So let me ask you a question today. As followers of Christ and in the light of what he has done for all of us, can we warrant living each day with such a deficiency in hope and faith, acting as if today and every day is more or less uh, just another day in paradise? Or as if life is miserable and we can't wait for the Lord to take us away from here so, so that we can escape this world and leave everyone else to deal with the mess after we're gone. If the Lord has left breath in our lungs and life in our bodies, is that not another day that he's given us to praise him and to serve him? That's my question. So I hope that our passage today um, in God's word will help to encourage you today. And if you are in that place of cynicism, perhaps it will help to pull you out of it and back into a place of faith and hope. Because with Christ, any day, even today, has the potential to be an amazing and a blessed day and not just another day in paradise. Transitioning a little bit, last week, Pastor Tanya preached a, a powerful message on the passage about the prodigal son, and uh, we're going to revisit that place of the Father's love, grace, and mercy today. Um, in my sermon a couple weeks ago, I'm kind of picking up where I left off, and it was on the, um, a, a passage that followed the events that occurred on Pentecost, um, and we had talked about the fellowship of the believers uh, that resulted from that. <clears throat> from Acts 2, 42 through 47. Um, and of course, we know that on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit uh, came down, the tongues of fire dwelled upon them, and they were uh, speaking in foreign tongues that people from other nations could hear. And it was, uh, it was a miracle. There, there was no, no getting around that. It was an incredible thing. Uh, and Peter then uh, used that miracle to springboard into um, a gospel presentation, a, a proclamation of Christ as the Messiah, as the Savior, whom they had rejected. And he called them to repentance. Um, and, and, and as we know, um, I'm just going to, well, that day 3,000 were added to their number and many people did repent and they received uh, 
Peter's preaching and his word. And uh, Acts 2, 42 through 47, just as a refresher, that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with all the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So um, it's a beautiful response, and it's, it really is the ideal vision of the church, and it's something we wish we could see locally and nationally and worldwide. We wish we could see this model of church. But it's, the church is big, and there's a lot of uh, logistical challenges in that, and there's a lot of uh, theological problems and all kinds of other problems that come in and it has perhaps uh, broken, up, broken us up to the extent that we may not ever see that beyond our, our local church, and we can at least hope for that here in our church at Leonardtown, right? <laughs> um, but nonetheless, it's a beautiful description of uh, the harmony, the diversity, the unity of the early church um, that we see, because there was people from all, all, over, all other nations. I think there was 15 or 16 different nations listed that all came together and, and were a part of the early church. <clears throat> they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer, um, which we could also do. They took care, well, we don't have the apostles here, but we have the words of the apostles for sure. So, <laughs> um, They ate together. They encouraged one another. They took care of each other. They prayed together. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So let us, let us uh, live and be like the Acts 2 church. This moves into our passage today, and this is Acts 3, uh, following that passage right there. Um, One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of the prayer at 3 in the afternoon. I'm just going to stop there for a moment. So Luke makes this transition. Uh, He says, one day. So we don't know exactly when this day was. Uh, Probably, maybe it wasn't the next day. Maybe it was a week later. Maybe it was a month later. We really don't know for sure, but we do know that daily... They are making their visit to the temple, uh, Peter and John, going there every day to pray, to worship, and likely to preach the gospel as well and proclaim uh, Christ as the Messiah amongst the many of the Jews who still at that point uh, didn't believe or, or had rejected Christ as the Messiah. And I would, I'm willing to bet that when Peter and John woke up each day, they weren't looking at each of those days as just another day. Just another day in paradise, John. What do you say? <laughs> Uh, I highly doubt that was the case. I, I, I find it hard to believe that these weren't men on a mission every day. God had called them to something. He had empowered them with the, the Holy Spirit to do incredible things. Uh, and that's exactly what they were going to do. They were going to the temple. Uh, you know, I wonder how they went to the temple. Was it, you know, just Peter and John? Where were the others at? Were they, did they hang back? Did they go somewhere else? Was it a big entourage of guys, like, just strutting down the street together, you know, behind Peter and John? I, I don't know. Well, it's interesting to imagine what that might have looked like. There's a few different hours of prayer throughout the day at the temple, um, one at 9 a.m. Uh, their time, I believe it would have been the third hour. For us, it's the ninth hour. Our day start, starts at midnight. Their day started at 6 uh, p.m. So, uh, but there were three times of prayer throughout the day where the, where, uh, the priests would uh, present offerings and, and pray. And, uh, of course, the temple... I think it's really hard to wrap our heads around just how big this place was and, and amazing it was and impressive it was. And there was a lot of places to hang out. There was the Court of the Gentiles. There was um, Solomon's Colonnade, which uh, seems like it surrounded the entire temple area. And there was a lot of place for people to hang out and to congregate and to talk. And, of course, uh, we know that the early church and, and the apostles took full advantage of this. This was their place. This was their meeting place where they often came together, um, even out you know, otherwise, if they were, may have met at each other's homes and, and places like that. But when they had a big gang of perhaps 3,000 people that had just been uh, saved, then this is likely the place where they were going to meet. <clears throat> and not to mention, while they were there, they could also have encounters with other um, Jews who had not accepted Christ. So this was a pretty, a pretty good place for them to be. Peter and John, uh, they were together, and we know, you know, you see it all the time in Scripture. Um, evangelists and uh, believers going out two by two, and they were together, and these guys were boys. They, uh, they had a, a fishing business together, uh, and that's, we know that's how, how they met Jesus. Um, well, kind of, 
kind of a different way, but Jesus called them from, from uh, their boats to become fishers of men, and that's where, uh, that's where they came from. And we also know that James, the brother of John, uh, was a part of Christ's inner circle, these three guys that were, you know, Christ had his, he had the 12, but he also had his, his uh, you know, three confidants, and Peter, James, and John that he brought into his inner circle. And, of course, these were uh, the big leaders of the early church as well. <clears throat> But these guys were working together, and um, Christ had empowered them and the others with tremendous power. Um, as he had promised them in, in John 14, 12, he said, Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. And today, Peter was going to put those words to the test. He was going to do something in the Lord's name. In verse 2, we hear uh, we have a new uh, person introduced into the story here who's known as um, the lame man, right? <laughs> um, now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg for those going into the temple courts. Um, Nate, if you could flip to a couple of those pictures or diagrams. Um, so this is just kind of give you an idea. So this is kind of the entire uh, temple structure here. And, you know, it may not be exact. We don't know exactly what it looked like at this point, I don't think. But um, that is showing the East Gate and the Mount of Olives would have been uh, underneath there from our perspective here. But we're looking uh, from the east uh, at the temple there. Uh, Nate, you can go to the next. That, that's a representation of uh, Solomon's Colonnade, which would have kind of surrounded the whole temple complex. Uh, there's also a smaller area known as Solomon's Porch or Portico. Um, and one, one more, Nate. If you don't mind, and that there is just a closer view of the temple. So that was um, so you, from my understanding, you would enter through the beautiful gate from the east, from the east or the outside, um, or actually it was the uh, yeah it was the, it was the beautiful gate or the Shashan gate, I believe it's, it's pronounced, and then you would come in to this next gate here. Um, I'm sorry, the uh, the external gate would have been the um, Golden Gate, I believe, or the Shashan gate. Then you would have come. The next gate that you would enter from the east would be this one here, which is the beautiful gate, which I believe was made of uh, copper. And then after that, you would have the uh, gate, the Nicanor gate, which would take you into the temple. And when you go through that first gate that we see right here, the beautiful gate, it would take you into the women's court and the different uh, chambers and so on. So just kind of give you a, a, a picture here. But the man would have been waiting outside of this first gate here, the beautiful gate. Um, which does look pretty beautiful from the picture there. I don't know if that's exactly what it looked like. Uh, just kind of give you, uh, help your imagination to, to see what this may have looked like. Uh, thank you, Nate. Uh, so carrying on, that, um, the man was lame from birth, at which we know later was 40 years up to this point. The man was about 40 years old. And as far as we know, he never really walked on his own, and he had been in this condition for a, a very long time and didn't, didn't really know any different. Um, He would be brought to the temple, and he would be laid at the gate called Beautiful. They would put him there every day to beg uh, alms from those who were going in and out of the temple. And alms are basically just uh, money or food or, or other uh, goods that would help this man survive. And, you know, when I think about this man, I have so many questions about him. Like, what is his name, for example? You know, you think about guys uh, in the New Testament, some other guys that are known for things that probably aren't the best thing to be known, known for, like uh, doubting Thomas. You know, Thomas didn't doubt forever, but he doubted long enough to be called doubting Thomas, I guess, so shame on him. Um, there's also uh, blind Bartimus, or blind Bart, we know him as blind, well, he wasn't, he's not, wasn't blind anymore, but we still call him blind Bart, you know, that's how we remember people. So, as tempted as I am to name this man, uh, I wasn't going to say lame Larry, but that just came to mind. I was going to name him Larry, just to give him a name, but you know what, I, I look at it this way. If Luke didn't think it was important enough to give this guy a name or, or say what his name was or maybe he didn't know it, then I won't either. So we'll just leave it at that. But if you want to call him Larry, then uh, suit yourself. <laughs> uh, this man was brought to the gate every day. Uh, I also wonder, you know, he was brought to the gate every day uh, by his friends. Somebody had to bring him there. He wasn't going to get himself there. And I'm pretty sure they didn't have wheelchairs back then. So there are a couple kind souls probably helped to get him there every day. You know, were, were these his family? Were these his friends? Could they not take care of him where, to the point where he had to beg? I, I, I don't know. I have so many questions that I'd be interested in, in knowing about this man, his life. Was his parents, had they passed away? Was he alone? 
Was he an outcast? Were people, was he overlooked? Was he outside of the, the fellowship? Did people just blow him off and not take him seriously? You know, there's a lot of things about this man's life. Maybe he was even, there's nothing that says he wasn't a believer. It just says he was lame from the day he was born. It doesn't say he wasn't a believer at that point either. So, you know, it, it's hard to tell what this man's situation was coming into that day. <clears throat> but I could almost guarantee you that there was a, a part of this man after 40 years that said, it's just another day in paradise, right? <laughs> I can almost guarantee he did not plan on this happening today after this long stretch of 40 years from birth, uh, not being able to walk. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked him for money. Uh, did he know who Peter and John were? I don't know. <laughs> maybe he did, maybe he didn't. They seemed like they were pretty famous guys at this point, uh, at least among uh, the circle of believers, I, I, I'd imagine everyone knew him at that point. Um, but of course, the man sees him and he asks for money. And when you really think about it, what better place to ask for money than right outside the church? If you get people after church, you could probably be rich <laughs> when they're coming out. Um, this is a place where we are called to show compassion and generosity and, and love and all those things. It's, it's a wonder that more people don't just hang out outside of the churches on Sunday after church if they really want to get some money. Um, maybe they will at some point. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the man is there, and he's expecting, uh, you know, God calls us to kindness, compassion, charity, all those things, and the man knows, knows that, and that's where he kind of strategically places himself. In my lifetime, I've encountered many men and women who have asked me for money at, at various places and different environments. Uh, there's certainly kind of an art and a science to doing it, I think. I've seen some that are more uh, successful than others at doing it. Um, there's some proper uh, tactics and timing involved and um, the, your demeanor, the, your politeness, how you ask, and, and all those kinds of things uh, kind of matter. Uh, but there is some, some cases, and, I, and you know, I know around here, and I don't want to get off on this tangent too much, but sometimes we question if people uh, really need it. You know, sometimes we're skeptical. and I, I'll never forget a day I was with uh, Caleb, and we were handing out some tracts and talking to people, and I handed someone a $5 bill, and uh, without saying anything, they took the $5, they walked directly across the street where I'm pretty sure they purchased uh, something to continue feeding whatever their addiction was at that point, and I just, <laughs> I was like, I just basically paid, gave that person money to go buy more drugs, and uh, that was pretty sad, that was pretty eye-opening for me. So just handing money isn't always going to solve the problem, but you know, Nonetheless, we're still called to, to help and, and, and to show love and, and support and all those things. But discernment is needed. I think that's kind of the bottom line there. James said uh, in, in chapter 2, verses uh, 14 through 17, James says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And of course, Peter, uh, as we know in this story, was ready to accompany his faith with some action and some deeds here. Uh, but when we think about these examples of people we're not really sure about, we're a little skeptical. Uh, our friend Larry, I'm sorry, uh, the lame man was not one of those guys. Um, he had legitimate uh, challenges that he was facing. A man has not walked uh, for 40 years. How, how could this man work? He couldn't sit behind a computer at that time and, you know, enter data. Uh, this man couldn't do manual labor. He needed, he was completely reliant on the charity and the love of other people. So not the case with this man that we're talking about today. Peter looked straight at the man, as did John, and Peter said, look at us. And I wonder how did Peter say it? Was he like, hey, snap out of it. <laughs> I probably just woke a few of you up with that one. I'm sorry if you were sleeping well. Peter said, snap out of it. Uh, <laughs> look at us. Um, and, and, I, and I've had some encounters where if you do see, see someone who, who's asking for money, a lot of times they won't look you in the eye. And it could be out of shame. It could be just a lost hope. Um, you know, a lot of times I think they assume nobody's going to give them anything. And that's really sad, especially when these are people, it, it, and if these are people that are genuinely in need. In this case, that was this man. He couldn't, didn't even look him in the eye. He may have just put a hand out. Uh, not really sure, but whatever the case Peter went on the offense. The man, was, you could say, was on the offense first because he asked for the money. But Peter went on the offense because he, he was, he was going to 
uh, make this a little bit more than just an exchange of money or, or a handing of money. And he gets the man's attention. And the man looks up, and he sees Peter and John, and Peter looks him in the eye. <clears throat> and the man, when he sees Peter look at him in the eye, he's thinking, surely this man's going to give me something, and it might be something good, right? He had, he had a lot of hope uh, to think that Peter was going to, you know, he might have made his day. Uh, but Peter was not uh, exactly going to do that. So the man gave him, uh, gave Peter and John, he gave him uh, his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, walk. Uh, of course, we know uh, Peter, as he said, he didn't have silver and gold. He didn't have money to hand this man, but he had something far better that he was able to give him because he was empowered by the Holy Spirit and because of his faith in Christ. Um, and, Jesus, and Peter, in the name of He makes it very specific uh, whose name this is in. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, in the midst of the temple, and all these people, and probably many people who uh, have rejected Christ or or maybe didn't even know who Christ was. He makes this announcement. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Sorry. In the name of Jesus. (laughs) Yeah, thank you. Walk. (laughs) In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Uh, so this is an incredible moment, of course. Um, verse 7, taking him by the right hand, Peter helps him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Uh, the lame man that we call the lame man was no longer lame for the first time in his life. And this is nothing short of a miracle. And it's funny when I try to imagine this, I don't imagine the man uh, kind of like wrestling his way to his feet. This man, it says he leaped to his feet. He shot up in the air for the first time in his life. And uh, what did he do? He jumped to his feet, he began to walk, and I'm sure soon after he probably began to run if he could. Uh, then, he went, um, then he went with them into the temple courts. Maybe this man never even entered the temple courts, hardly ever. He was usually outside asking for money. It's not today. <laughs> today he was going in. He was going to let everybody know what had happened, walking and jumping and praising God. And that, of course, is an awesome thing and uh, calls for rejoicing and praise uh, from everybody who hears this story. <clears throat> next we read in verse 9 when all the people saw him walking and praising God they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called beautiful and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him so of course um, you see something like this going on you're going to be like what's going on over there and you might walk over and see what's happening if you feel safe if you don't you might run but in this case the people feel safe and they walk over to see what all the fuss is about, and uh, many of them recognize this man. He's the man that was sitting outside of the gate every day uh, asking for money, and they go over, and, and everyone's rejoicing, and they're saying, how did this happen? This is amazing, right? Kind of like uh, on the day of Pentecost. People are baffled. They're wondering, how, how could this possibly be happened? This man has been sitting there for years, lame for his entire life, yet here he is, leaping and running and jumping around. Just imagine... Uh, <laughs> I was thinking about uh, maybe some folks in here, like my dad, (coughs) who, uh, you know, what was the, well, you know, actually a a better story probably is my father-in-law was telling me last week uh, that he tried to run, and, you know, he's about 70, right? He just turned 70. He said he had tried to run a few days before, and he just couldn't do it. He tried to run. It just just wasn't going to happen for him. Just imagine if if all of a sudden he had his 20-year-old basketball legs again, and he was able to run and jump and do all those things. I mean, how amazing would that be? but especially if you've never done it before. So this is uh, just a, an awesome thing to behold. So all the people are gathered together in amazement and, and looking at this man, verse 11. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. <clears throat> was the man holding on to Peter and John because he was having a hard time staying up all of a sudden, or was he, just, was he embracing them? Was this a hug? Thank you guys so much. My life has completely changed. Uh, because of this. Who knows? But he's with them together, uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a powerful moment that everyone sees there. But then something different happens, and this is a uh, part that we, we didn't read earlier. And um, Peter sees all this, and he addresses the people, kind of like he did in, uh, in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. And it kind of makes you wonder, you know, when Peter steps up here, is the party over? Is Peter coming out here to throw a cold bucket of ice on this party? Because he comes out and he says, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us 
as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk. That's a pretty interesting way to start a party out, right? <laughs> You're already kind of questioning uh, the, the confusion or maybe the, uh, uh, the motives of the people here. And, and Peter doesn't waste any time by telling them who was responsible um, as much as he did when he healed the man in the name of Christ. He says, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. So Peter almost seems, rather than joining the party and, having, and joining this big celebration that's going on, Peter, uh, he uses this event. He doesn't sit there and talk about the great faith of the man, and uh, necessarily, he says, it is Christ. It, it is my faith in Christ. It is the man's faith in Christ. It is Christ who is responsible for this. And why are you looking at me and John as if we have some kind of magic power here? It's not us who are responsible. It's, it's Christ. And a lot of times when good things happen for us in life, we might look around and be like, man, that guy is really something. That guy's really got some incredible, uh, or, or, or gal, the guy or girl, they have very uh, impressive abilities, you know. But instead of looking sideways, we should be looking up at the Lord and saying, look at what the Lord has done in and through this person. That's an incredible thing. But um, these people, at least initially, seem to be looking at Peter and John and saying, who are these guys, you know? Uh, they're giving them the credit. And Peter quickly wants to change that and make sure that they know who's responsible for this. And he talks about the name. Um, it is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed this man and that heals all of us. Jesus' name, what does that mean? Is it just the name, speaking the name Jesus? It's, a, it's the meaning and the power behind the name of Jesus. It's the Messiah, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, Emmanuel, God with us. It's, it's all these things in this, in this one name, the Son of God who has come down to save us. That is the power uh, that Peter expended when he healed this man. And therefore, Christ is and was responsible. So Peter quickly goes into kind of a, what you might even say, a rebuke, letting these people know. A lot of you that are here, uh, which is similar to what he said in Acts 2, a lot of you same ones that are here are the same ones that put this man on the cross and you crucified him. In fact, Pilate, Try to let this man go. <laughs> and you turn out to be more wicked than Pilate because you insisted that he was crucified on the cross. Ouch. That's a, that's a pretty harsh uh, reality there to, to think about. You disown the holy and righteous one and ask that a murderer be released to you. Barabbas, the murderer, was released and Christ was handed over to be crucified. These are pretty incredible things that Peter is saying here and bold He then says in, in verse 17, Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. And, of course, we know uh, there's many messianic uh, passages about Christ's suffering and death on the cross. Um, Psalm 22, Isaiah uh, 52, 53, uh, Zechariah 12, and, and, and Daniel, and so on. We know... Um, God, God was not surprised by this. He knew the hearts of the people. He knew that they would reject Christ and what they would ultimately do. He wasn't surprised by this. And that's kind of the amazing thing here when you really think about it. And this is kind of the, the but God moment here. <clears throat> he says, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance. How many of us have acted in ignorance and rejected the Messiah in our lives and have rebelled against God? I think most of us in here could probably say at some point we were in the same boat. But God, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets saying that the Messiah would suffer. God, um, nonetheless, by his love, by his mercy, by his grace, still continues to call us, even in spite of our rebellion, even in, in spite of our rejection of Christ. Romans 5, 8, <clears throat> For God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And of course, there's John three sixteen and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world would be saved through him. 
And even in spite of this rebellion, the saving mission is still on, and Peter is calling these people to repentance. In the next verse, in verse 19, he says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the message, or, I'm sorry, the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he has promised long ago through his holy prophets. So Peter, again, calling these people to repentance. Turn from the path you're on, the wide path, the wide road that leads to destruction, and turn towards that narrow path, a narrow gate that leads to salvation, that leads to holiness, that leads to peace with God in and through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the gate that we must go through. You might recall um, a a different way that Peter called people to repentance in Acts uh, 2. He said in verse 36, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, after all the other things that Peter said before that as well, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off and for, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized. And on that day, about 3,000 3, were added to the number. <clears throat> Peter talks about um, God he says, heaven, and, heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. And even though I know I joked about a little bit about, you know, wishing that the Lord would take us out of this cruel world, we still look forward to it. Let's be honest. We want to be in that place uh, when God creates the new heaven, the new earth, and gives us these imperishable bodies. That's going to be uh, a glorious day. We have no doubt about that. But while we're here, we're still, we're still servants of the Lord. We're still working for him. We're his representatives, him and his ambassadors. We are Uh, called to serve him as long as we have breath in our body. You might think about the Apostle Peter and all the things that Peter went through. At one point, Peter was stoned and left for dead. (laughs) They actually thought he was dead. I'm sorry, I'm talking about Paul. Did I say Peter? Paul. Paul was stoned and left for dead. And uh, and after, I guess, everyone had walked away and left him for dead, Paul somehow or another manages to get back up. (laughs) Paul had been shipwrecked. He had been beaten and whipped and all kinds of other things. And he served the Lord faithfully even down to his last breath. Uh, when he was martyred. So, you know, we have so much uh, inspiration for uh, serving the Lord faithfully, even in these times when they're, when they're tough. <clears throat> Continue on, verse 22. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold of these days And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on the earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Uh, So Israel and the Jews have basically gotten first dibs. And we know that Uh, Jesus started by making his rounds around uh, what would have been uh, Israel before, but now is uh, split up into uh, Judea and Samaria and all these other uh, places. Jesus went throughout these places calling the lost sheep of Israel back to God. <clears throat> and they had first dibs. But we know that the time for them was short and that the time of the Gentiles was about to begin. Uh, and here we are 2,000 years later uh, and this call to repentance still stands for us here today. If you're here today, if you're listening to this or any other gospel message, you still have time. You still have a chance. And so does everyone else out there outside of these doors. And uh, you know, we still have work to do here. And if we didn't, Christ would come back. Christ will come back when it's the right time. But until then, we still have work to do for the Lord. But nonetheless, the Jews, were, they had first dibs. Um, we know that ultimately the majority of them would reject Christ. Um, the Christians would scatter due to persecution. The temple would be destroyed in 70 AD. Uh, and the rest is kind of history uh, leading up to this point. There are many different responses on this day. Uh, We read in verse 4, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the the Sadducees, they came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. 
And they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put him in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. So if my math is right, and uh, I feel like I'm okay at math, I think they added about 2,000 to their number that day on top of the 3,000 they had before. So this is another huge day. I mean, that's nothing to scoff at. 3,000 people putting their faith in Christ in one day and 2,000 on this day here. Um, Nothing short of uh, amazing. And it really highlights uh, the power of God working uh, through Peter and John on this day. Many different responses on this day, though. Of course, we know that the priests... The Sanhedrin and, and anyone else that was affiliated with them came in to kind of uh, rain on the parade here while Peter and John were still talking. But guess what? The damage was done. It didn't matter. <laughs> and how many times uh, when people come to try and put this fire out, uh, does it continue to burn? Nobody uh, can stop the Lord's plans. Nobody can put his fire out besides him. Um, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but it just reminded me of uh, we were at Lake Anna a few weeks back and and they had a little fire pit there, and I was, uh, I was the fire guy, believe it or not, which is kind of scary. It should be scary for everybody if I'm the fire guy that makes the fire and puts it out. Anyway, I knew you are supposed to put out the fire at the end of the night. Well, on this day, it was pretty windy outside, and uh, I just made the fire, and it just kept getting windier. And I was like, ah, that's kind of dangerous. You know, there might be some embers that fly in the yard or, Lord forbid, the house or something like that, and I'm going to be responsible. So I went ahead and got a, a big old pitcher of water, and I went to put the fire out. And I was kind of tired, so soon after that, I went to bed. And of course, as usual, I had a hard time sleeping. And I was laying there thinking about the fire, wondering if it, maybe it's still burning. And I was a little concerned about that. So I went on, uh, you know, it was late in the night. I went on outside, and I looked. Well, guess what? The fire had gone back to life. It was burning a little bit. <laughs> and I was like, shoot. So I went back in. I got a pitcher of water, and I tried to put it out again. And I was like, all right, I think I got it this time. And I went back to bed. And then it was about a couple hours later, I woke up again, and I was thinking about, I was like, man, I bet that fire is probably still burning. And sure enough, I went out there, and it was still glowing red. It wasn't, it wasn't a fire, but it was glowing red. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. How is this thing still burning? I've been dumped at least four or five pitchers of water on it. And I finally dumped uh, a couple more on there, and I said, all right, this is the last time. This is going to have to be good enough. And uh, pretty... I don't know, maybe the fire got put out, maybe it didn't. I'm going to go ahead and just assume that that fire was put out on the last, the third time was a charm. But nobody is going to put the Lord's fire out, <laughs> no matter how many pictures they put on it. And that's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin was thinking they were, they were going to be able to do. They were trying to put the fire out and snuff it out. And it's been try, people have tried to snuff this fire out all throughout history. And guess what? Here we are today, still doing the Lord's work. So <clears throat> 2,000 were added to the number that day. So in light of our, uh, this miracle that we hear about today in this passage, will today or tomorrow and the following days be no, just another day for you? I really hope not. I hope that you've been inspired by this story here, and that you won't accept a mediocre or average faith, uh, that you won't believe that anything is, is possible for God, and that Christ can transform lives and hearts and minds. Is the arm of the Lord too short to save, to heal, to do anything? Will you seize the day like Peter and John, loving the Lord, your neighbors, and seizing the day, giving your best to serve him? Uh, It's kind of similar to the psalm that Sonny read earlier, but Psalm 34, 1 through 4 says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glory the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. And I'd like to close with Paul's words, and again, just to kind of reflect on all the things that Paul went through. Uh, Philippians 4, often, uh, 4.13, often taken out of context, but when you really think about Paul's story, uh, it makes, makes a lot of sense, and it says something a little bit different than what we think it says. Uh, starting at verse 4, he's leaving the Philippians with a little bit of uh, encouragement here. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gen- gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, 
whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. And I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Praise the Lord.